This true experience reads like a ghost story, but there is a fey element to it. It was at some point between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, and a friend and I had been out for a drink and decided to go for a ghost walk, named as such as we were headed to a place called Gibbet's Hill. In centuries past, this place held the gallows in which sheep rustlers and other executed criminals were locally hung. It is a place that, since childhood, I have felt exudes a strange atmosphere. Gibbets Hill lies between two crossroads along a path called Douglas Lane. Douglas Lane itself is reputed to be haunted by a grey lady, who is said to be the specter of a Lady Douglas, who was murdered. That night, there was a crisp covering of snow a few inches deep, and there was a bright moon that cast a purplish-blue light upon the snow. We turned onto Douglas Lane, and almost immediately, a fox crossed our path. We didn't think much of it at the time, and proceeded along the lane to a ramshackle, empty old place, which, as children, we used to call Mad Mary's house. Mad Mary probably wasn't mad, but she was a reclusive old woman who sometimes twitched the curtains and looked out. As children, we thought she was a witch. Mary had at this time been dead for a number of years and her house had fallen into a state of disrepair. We cut behind it onto an open field where there was a public trail and were surprised to see lights on inside the house. Except on second glance, there were no lights on. It appeared to have been an illusion cast by the strange moonlight. We kept walking, feeling a little unnerved at this point. The hole was quiet and still, save for the oddly nocturnal cawing of a solitary crow roosting in a skeletonized tree near the crossroads. Then, suddenly, there was a horse. It arrived seemingly out of nowhere, and we both jumped when we saw it. Now, it wasn't unusual to see horses in the area, but we had spooked ourselves up for the walk and were feeling jittery. So, though the horse seemed friendly and approached us curiously, we didn't hang around. We crossed the field to a spot in the far corner where a stile stood at the end of a thorn hedge. We planned to climb the stile over the fence that surrounded the field to get us to Gibbet's Hill. Except the stile was not there. That seemed odd, as it had been there for years, so we looked along the hedge to see if it had been moved. We found no sign of it. We retraced our steps to see if we'd missed it, but still we could not find it anywhere. Knowing something of folklore, I talked about being pixie-led and joked that we should turn our coats inside out to break whatever spell we were under. But we both decided it was too cold to take our coats off. So I said I'd heard that whistling was another method to reputedly break a fairy spell. My friend, being a fan of M.R. James, said that whistles can sometimes also attract the wrong attention from the other side. That did not stop me whistling, however. Strangely, especially as this area was an open area on top of a hill and not really an echoey place, my whistling created a strange echoing. There was a short delay to it of only a second or so, but still noticeable enough that the whistle hung on the air and then returned, as if in mimicry, rather than a bounce. We both decided there was an odd effect at play, and soon we arrived back at the corner of the field where the stile was meant to be. It was still missing. Then, there was a noise at the other end of the hedge, low down. It sounded like something charging at us, breaking twigs all the while. When I remember this in my mind's eye, it is like a triple zoom camera effect that you see in some films, where it appears a figure is stationary, but the background rushes forward. Whatever it was that made the noise, we did not see, nor did we wait to see it. Without a word to each other, we both scrambled over the thorn hedge and ran across the field, only stopping when we had reached a path leading back to our village. We stopped then and looked at each other. I said, what was that all about? Neither of us had any idea, but whatever it was had us both feeling panicked. 
Some days later, I retraced the walk in daylight. The snow had melted by then, so I could not follow exact footprints, but discovered at the end of the thorn hedge, the stile, where it had always been. I couldn't figure out why we hadn't been able to see it the other night. It wasn't hidden at all. There was also no clue as to what had made the rushing, crunching noise that had frightened us both. I don't class this experience as specifically fairy or ghost, but I did get the feeling that we were being pixie-led or tricked in some way by unseen forces. I do think some places are thin, and that the reasons for that could vary, but although not stating a fixed belief as to the actual nature and causes of this, I do believe supernatural experiences are real, and that reality itself is something there are more questions about than answers. I live out in the country in Iowa. This happened during the winter. I was in the garden taking pictures of some colorful frozen spheres I had made with balloons. This is a decorating idea you can find on the internet. You fill balloons with water and food coloring, freeze them, and then remove the balloons. And you end up with these beautiful colorful spheres you can put in your garden to brighten it up when the only color outside is white. I snapped some pictures of the blue frozen spheres I had made with my cell phone and noticed nothing unusual at the time, but later when I downloaded the pictures to send to a friend, I saw what appeared to be fairy fingers on one of the images. These fingers were stretched across the lens as if to block the shot. I had no idea where these fingers came from. I went back outside later to try to recreate the image, but was unable to do so. The fingers in the picture are long and tapered and very clear. There is absolutely no explanation for them. No other objects, branches, or leaves in the area could have created this effect. There has always been activity in and around our home, but nothing as concrete as this. I do believe I captured a set of fairy fingers that day in the snow. One winter night, my husband and I were walking in a wooded and secluded area near downtown Atlanta. It was late winter, not especially cold. We were walking through a garden, a sunken area with a main street that ran along the top. There were halogen lights on the street, but none in the garden. This garden was formal, but parts were naturalized going into the remains of a forest, which still had some virgin timber. There was a creek that ran through one end of it, and an overflow ditch, very deep, which meandered through the whole area. Across the road was an estate with a nature preserve that had never been cut, and, though open to the public, maintained the policy that visitors remain on the path and disturb nothing. These two places belonged to contemporaries and were held in trust, which protected them from destruction or development. Okay, as to my experience, it was dark. I was walking some distance from my husband when I spotted a light in a tree. It was a glowing green light, about the size of a child's ball. I thought it was probably a mylar balloon stuck in the bare branches and catching light. I was trying to determine where it could be reflecting light from, so I stepped closer. But then, though it might be hard to believe, I completely forgot about it. I was standing by the deep overflow ditch and something else caught my attention. It's difficult to describe. The best I can describe it is that a small bit of space around a bush got darker. And somehow out of this, a small thing appeared. It looked like a classic Brian Froud illustration of a gnome. Maybe three feet high, rustic clothes, pants, shirt, vest, and slouchy leather hat. 
The pants and vest seemed a brownish green, the shirt pale. The hat was a russet color. His eyebrows were bushy, hair long, unkempt, and both brows and hair were white. His face was hairless but wore a scowl. I have no idea how I saw the colors in the dark. This man, for he seemed male, was completely unanimated. I was struck dumb for a moment. Then I screamed and ran for the car. I remember that I yelled, We have to get into technology and drive away! My husband ran as fast as I did. He had no idea what I had seen, but he knew I was terrified. He probably thought I had stumbled upon a murdered body. I really had sheer panic. I went back soon after in the daylight and can only add that there was no mylar balloon in the tree and that the bush the gnome materialized out of was what we in the south call mountain laurel. It was a very special, quiet place. If you look into the background of the garden, the estate, and the very large nature center across the road, you will find that their owners protected them from development. The family of the woman who originally owned the estate tried to have her ruled mentally incompetent for refusing to have developed a hundred or so acres. I think now the place is sacred. Two nights ago, I think I saw a fairy. I'd like to give you some background first to explain what was going on before and after this event. I'm a girl in my 20s in college. I also practice Wicca. My whole life I felt a deep connection with the fairy realm. I've had no reason to hold such a strong belief as I have never seen a fairy before, but there it was. I married young and my husband and I recently bought a house in a small village. The village is in a remote area of upstate New York, with mostly farmland surrounding it. The house fell into our laps in an almost serendipitous way. It was in the exact location where we were looking for, the exact kind of house we always dreamed of. It's also house number seven, which I've heard is a fairy number, whatever that means. So, two nights ago, I was having an anxiety attack while in bed watching TV with my husband. School and work have been stressful for me lately, and I was worrying about not getting everything done that I needed to. I've recently cut back on smoking cigarettes as well, but on this night I decided to go outside and smoke in order to relax a bit. I knew my husband wasn't happy, but I went anyway. I went out to my back deck and put my headphones in. I was listening to the song Ice Dance from the soundtrack of the movie Edward Scissorhands. It was as I looked into the yard, which was covered by a few inches of snow. I stood, bent over, with my elbows on the railing and my eyes focused on the small forested area behind our lot. It's what they call a forever wild, like a tiny one to two acre nature reserve. Right at the tree line, I suddenly saw movement. It was light in color, so it stood out amongst the trees. At first, I thought I was looking at a cat running the opposite direction. There's a stray in my neighborhood that I feed. We call her Pizza, and she has white on her back legs and tail. I thought to myself, that must have been Pizza looking for us, and waited to see her again. Instead, I saw whatever it was bound like a cat or a fox back in front of the trees. But it wasn't either of those things. It was translucent like see-through and faintly glowing a sort of bluish color. It was standing on two legs, upright like, well, like a little person, maybe eight inches tall. I think it was a little man. I couldn't see it clearly enough to see if it actually was a man, but the presence felt masculine. I saw the thing make a few more bounding leaps before it just sort of faded into darkness. The whole thing probably took 30 seconds. After it was gone, I suddenly registered what I had seen and my stomach dropped the way it does when you miss a step on the stairs. I stood up straight and squinted to try to see it again. 
Not a second later, a huge gust of wind blew towards me. This isn't unusual for the season, but the strength and timing of it was a little unnerving. After the nerves wore off and my body normalized again, I suddenly felt happy. I just smiled and laughed a little bit. A short time later, my husband came out to check on me. He told me I seemed different somehow, that it was weird my mood had changed so suddenly. We decided to go on a night drive after that, and we had fun. I told him what I had seen, and he believed me. The next day, I saw a raven circling the forever wild. I've never seen a raven before in my life. For most of my life, I have lived in a mountain area. Not anything that would isolate us from society and internet access, but a place still considered a mountain area. My house is surrounded by forest and hills, so it would be an ideal place for an adventurous spirit to explore. This occurred when I was 16 and my friend 14 at the time. Me, my friend, and my dad were out in our backyard acres looking for a Christmas tree. It was early December, so there was snow on the ground, but the cold wasn't so unbearable that day, so we decided that would be a good day to go looking for a tree. We got to this gap between two hills, and that's when I saw it. It looked like a cave, completely made out of bushes. There was an opening just perfect for someone to crawl into. For some reason, I was intrigued by this bush cave thing, and curiosity got the better of me. I didn't feel like it was dangerous, nor did I get any bad vibes from it, so being the curious teenage girl I was, I figured there was no harm in exploring it. So I walked up to the bush cave and crawled into it. My friend must have been curious about the cave too, that or curious about where I was going because when I looked back, she was right behind me. Once we were inside, it was like we were in a whole different world. The ground was covered in moss, and there was a tiny stream going right down the middle of the cave. The air was warm, and the atmosphere was peaceful and welcoming. It was like we had just exited winter and entered spring, like they were two different rooms in a building. The cave didn't go very far, just enough for both of us to fit comfortably inside. And the ceiling of the cave was still the branches on the bushes that surrounded it. It was just high enough for us to sit up and still have at least five inches above our heads. And the cave itself was just wide enough for both of us to lay down and have just enough room to toss and turn. As unbelievable as it sounds, it was almost like it was made just for the both of us. Needless to say, my friend and I were in awe upon our discovery. We sat there for a few minutes, taking in the beauty and peacefulness of the place in silence. It was almost like we were in a trance. Then suddenly we heard my dad calling out to us saying he'd found a tree. We rushed out of the cave only to find ourselves in a different part of the woods. Naturally, my friend and I were a bit spooked and very confused about this. So we did what seemed logical at the time and ran over to where we heard my dad calling. Fortunately, we hadn't been moved that far away from where we originally were and caught up to my dad easily. He cut down a tree and hauled it back to the house. Once we got the tree taken care of, me and my friend went to my room and discussed what had happened. We were very confused and weirded out by this event. When we saw my friend's twin sister, who is also another best friend of mine, we told her all about it. The next time the twin sister came over to my place, I took her into the woods to show where we found the bush cave. However, when we got there, it was gone. There weren't even any bushes there at all. But that's not the most unsettling part about it. Another time when it was just me and the twin sister, we were hiking in the woods in a completely different area of the acres. And I saw it. The exact same bush cave in a different location. 
My friend and I didn't wait around long enough to see if anything would happen and wasted no time hightailing it back to the house. I never saw it again after, and I think I'm fine with that. Looking back on it now, I believe my friend and I were very lucky in that situation. Who knows what would have happened if my dad didn't call us over when he did. And to be honest, I think I'm okay not knowing. This happened about 10 years ago. I was in my mid-twenties and me and a close friend rented the top floor of a small duplex far north of Toronto. This duplex was off the side of Young Street, which is a major street in the area, but where the house is located is far enough north that the street is only one lane and there isn't much around. The house was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. This worked for us because we both had cars, and since Young Street was right there, it was an easy drive to grocery stores or wherever we wanted to go. That and it was very cheap. Despite this, there was something creepy about this house standing alone on the side of the road with nothing around but forests and fields. There weren't even street lights along this stretch of road, so it got very dark at night, which added to the creepiness of it. The house was old, but had been renovated and was nice inside. After we had lived there for about a week, we both started to notice that the people in the downstairs apartment seemed to stay awake all night and go quiet during the day. We could hear them talking sometimes at 3, 4, 5 in the morning. Most of the time it wasn't so loud that it would wake me up, but if I got up to go to the bathroom or woke up for any reason, I would start to hear them. I could never make out what they were saying, but I thought it was strange that they stayed up all night and I usually never saw them or heard them during the day. At first, I didn't think about it much. I was too focused on my own issues at the time, but eventually I started to notice a few unusual things. Like, I never actually saw these people, ever, only heard them. And they didn't seem to own a car since neither I nor my roommate had ever seen a car other than our own parked outside. It's possible they could have walked everywhere, but it would have been very unusual given that civilization was at least an hour's walk away. Now, I'm normally not one to look in other people's windows, but by this point, I was really starting to wonder about these people. So one night, I got home late from work and I noticed there was a light on in the apartment below. So I quickly looked through the window. The problem was, it was winter by this time and the window had frost all over it. It was also an old house and the windows weren't that clean. I could sort of make out a room inside with a table and maybe a chandelier hanging over it, which was casting the light. And I could see two blurry figures through the frost. I didn't look for very long, maybe a few seconds, and I thought, okay, at least I know the people downstairs really exist and I'm not imagining them. It was a couple of weeks later when my roommate came up to me looking freaked out. He said the landlord had come by to check the fire alarms when I was at work and that he had mentioned to the landlord how the people downstairs could sometimes get loud at night. The landlord said there were no people downstairs. At this point, the landlord thought maybe people were squatting down there, so he went down right away to check, and my roommate went with him to back him up. My roommate said all the doors on the bottom level were locked, and there was no sign of forced entry. Then he described the inside of the downstairs apartment. He said it was completely empty except for sawdust and some random pieces of plywood and drop cloths that were there because the place had recently been renovated. There was no table, no chandelier, no sign that anyone had stepped foot in the place for months. I couldn't believe it. I swore to my roommate that I had seen people in the apartment sitting at a table. I am positive to this day I saw this. A few nights later, I was lying in bed and I heard the voices again from below. I called to my roommate and said, 
Are you hearing this? He called back and said yes, he could hear them, but we should ignore them and just try to sleep. I could tell he was scared, his voice was shaking. He's not the type to believe in paranormal things, so I think the situation threw him for a loop. I was convinced by then that the place was haunted, but then something happened that made me wonder if we had something other than a normal ghost. It snowed a lot over the next few days, enough to cover the ground in several inches. I decided to look around the house to see if I could see any footprints in the snow in case there were real people we were dealing with who maybe got a copy of the key somehow. I did find prints in the snow. The thing is, they weren't human. There were two sets of prints. They went from the woods to the back door of the apartment downstairs, and then back out into the woods again. I'm not an outdoorsy type, so I had to look up the prints on the internet. And I found out they were deer prints. Now, I think it's possible that a couple of deers walked straight out of the forest up to the back door and then turned around and went back. But the prints didn't seem to indicate that. The prints looked like the deer had walked right through the door and then come back out later, following their own tracks back into the forest. I didn't know what to make of it. My roommate started staying over at his girlfriend's place a lot after that, and since I was too scared to stay there alone, I ended up staying at my boyfriend's. Finally, we both decided to move out. Looking back on the situation, I never got a negative feeling from whatever was spending time in the downstairs apartment. But I don't think it was a normal haunting. I think something out in the woods was using the house maybe as a meeting place. And I do believe that that something was fairy in origin. As to what they were discussing night after night, sometimes I wish I could know. And at other times, I think it's better, safer, that I don't. Thanks for watching, and special thanks to the subscribers who submitted their stories for this one. I have a few quick notes and an announcement. For notes, the first three stories in this video came courtesy of the Fairy Census, compiled by the Fairy Investigation Society. I edited those stories in small ways just to make them more friendly for narration, but if you want to read the originals, the link to the census is in the description. If you'd like to contribute to the next fairy census with your own true fairy stories, there is a link in the description for that as well. Though please don't forget to send your stories to me as well to be narrated in future videos. To submit your stories to me, my email is in the description. As for my announcement, a lot of you guys have been sending me not just your true fairy stories, but your fairy inspired artwork as well. And I've been finding your work so inspiring. I wanna start posting your fairy art on my different social media pages. So if you have fairy art or just fantasy art that you want to share, art that you work on while listening to my videos, whether it's an illustration, a puppet, a doll, a nature craft, a photograph, a song you wrote and performed, or even a fairy inspired playlist on something like Spotify or A-Tracks, just anything artistic and fairy inspired, please send it to me and I'll post your stuff on my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube feeds. I think this could be a fun way to spread the fairy inspiration around, especially for those working on projects related to this topic. So please send me work that you want to share to my email, which is in the description, with the subject fairy inspiration or fairy art. Oh, and don't forget to include a link to your social media page so I can credit you when I post it. Okay, that's it for my announcement. Um, I want to thank, as always, my supporters on Patreon for continuing to sponsor this content. If you like this content and want to support it on Patreon, there's a link in the description. Even a dollar a month is incredibly helpful. You can also support this content by liking, sharing, commenting, and subscribing if you're new. And until next time, this has been a visit from your scary fairy godmother.